different parts of the world have different sorts of weather. And to help us understand why, geographers have divided the world into climatic zones, from the very coldest to the hottest and wettest. If you're gonna come here, you'll need to wrap up really warm. You'll need a hat, gloves, and a very thick coat to stop the biting cold getting to you. And this is summer. Imagine what it's like in January when the temperature drops to minus 30 degrees Celsius and it snows for six months of the year. This is the Arctic. It's right at the top of the world in the Northern Hemisphere. For nine months of the year, the area is covered by snow and ice but for just a few months, from May to July, the temperature gets to just above freezing, and grasses and lichens manage to grow a little. The reason why it's so cold is that this part of the world is furthest from the equator, and therefore furthest from the sun. So the sun's rays are weaker here than in other parts of the world. A few tourists around here come to see the polar bears. Watching the polar bears is a tricky business. Going out on your own on foot is definitely not a good idea. Some people take a helicopter ride and look at them from the air. The cheap alternative is the bear buggy. Polar bears might look friendly, but they are very dangerous, and more and more are coming into the towns searching for food. They're doing it because their natural home, the ice cap, is shrinking. The earth is getting warmer, and polar bears can't find as much to eat as they used to. That's why these men are polar bear hunting. They're not trying to kill them, they're catching them, and when the bear is pretty heavily drugged, looking at them and fitting a transmitter so they can keep track of the bears. They want to know a lot more about polar bears so they can help them survive in the future. It all takes about half a day. It must be like having an operation. And then, when all the work is done, it's back out onto the ice in your very own helicopter. With nothing more than a sore head, hopefully. One of the interesting things about this place is that the weather varies a lot during the year. This is May, and it's a lovely warm morning. There are people swimming in the lake, the summer temperatures can be as high as 28 degrees Celsius. People come to the lake in the spring and summer to cycle or just walk on the mountain paths and trails. Shorts and short-sleeved shirts are all they need and plenty of water. It's pretty warm. Just beside the lake is a cable car and it carries a hundred people at a time up the mountain. It's busiest in winter, and that gives a clue to what people come here to do. They come to ski and snowboard. This area is known as the Alps. The high mountain range is a part of Europe that stretches from Slovenia in the east to France in the west. This part of the Alps is in Austria, and it's called the Tyrol. The whole of the area is geared up for the weeks between Christmas and Easter when the pistes are full of skiing families. While the temperatures in July average 28 degrees, in January it hardly gets above freezing. And at night, the temperature can fall to minus 12 degrees. And it can snow from November right through to April. You have to dress up really warm to cope with temperatures like this. But you also need sunglasses and suntan cream. The sun can be really bright. There are all sorts of contraptions to get people up the mountain. And at the top, it's like a different world. 
There are shops, restaurants and more lifts that carry the skiers onto the various runs. Every week, buses tip new holiday makers onto the pistes and into the ski schools. Children spend the week trying to improve their technique and speed. Then, on the last day, there's a downhill race. All the classes, from beginners to the really good skiers, follow the same route. And at the end of it all, the fastest gets a prize. But take a look at the mountain in the summer, when all the skiers have gone home. Some people are worried that all these tourists are damaging the high Alps. This is Fraser Island in southeast Australia. It's the largest sand island in the world. It's south of the equator. It's in the southern hemisphere. So it has summer when we have winter. And when Fraser Island is warm, it's cold in Britain. In January, the temperature can be as high as 32 degrees Celsius. And even in July, it averages 15 degrees. Fraser Island gets its fair share of rainfall, too. The average in July is 120 millimeters, but even in January, in the summer, rainfall averages 110 millimeters. The climate on the island is like the climate in the Mediterranean in countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain. It's easy to see why tourists come to Fraser Island. The sand and the lovely sea make it a perfect place for a beach holiday. But the explosion in numbers of tourists has made life difficult for the wildlife on the island, and especially the dingoes, Fraser Island's very own wild dogs. In the past, the dingoes got along with the indigenous peoples of the island, and to an extent, they still do. We traditionally carry on our relationship with the dingo right through to this day and age. Should we sit down and catch a feed out of the ocean or out of a dam or out of a creek somewhere, they'll come and they've always come. And they've always sat around with Aboriginal people. So uh, they feed off of what we feed and so on. The food chain goes on. What he leaves behind, the, the crows will come in and have a peck out and so on. So the food chain goes on. Life for the dingoes began to change in 1993 when the island was made a World Heritage Site. As time went on, we had about 100,000 people visiting this island per year and the pressure from those people today has increased to almost 400,000 people. More and more people came and they came for the fishing and for the relaxation on uh, the beach here. It was always a very big attraction. The dingoes feel threatened because there are so many more people about these days. But there's also lots more food around, so dingo numbers have grown too. It all means lots of pressure on the wildlife. And in the last few years, some of the dogs have turned nasty. Wild dogs have attacked tourists and on one occasion killed a child. It's an awful reminder that there's a constant struggle to balance the needs of the island's wildlife and tourists. These men are on a quest. They are experienced people. You have to be in these parts. They're looking for a very special animal that lives in this high African tropical rainforest. Tropical rainforests are some of the hottest and wettest places on Earth. The rain and the heat are what makes them special. And they're home to some of the most beautiful and rich plants and animals anywhere in the world. When you look at the places that have a tropical climate, you can see why. They're all close to the equator, the place where the sun is closest to the Earth, whether in winter or summer. In fact, in the tropics, there are not really any seasons like the ones we know, spring and autumn, at all. There's just the rainy season, that's sometimes called the monsoon, and a drier season. The temperature rarely falls below 30 degrees, and in the monsoon periods, May and September, the rainfall averages 190 millimetres a month. This rainforest is in Uganda, in Central Africa. It's called the Bawindi Impenetrable Park, and you can see why. It's hard work just hacking your way through the undergrowth. Some people visit the tropics for the beaches and swimming, but these tourists and their guides have come to search for an animal that is so rare, there are only 700 left in the whole world, the mountain gorilla. There used to be a lot more, but people have killed most of them. The gorillas have been hunted and poached, 
and their rainforest home destroyed. With only 700 mountain gorillas left in the world, the chances of actually seeing one are pretty slim. The guides know how to follow the tracks and to read the clues about where the gorillas are, but they have to be quick about it. The government in Uganda has very strict laws to protect the few gorillas that still live there. Only a few people are allowed into the restricted zone each week, and you have to keep your distance. The gorillas can die from diseases like measles and polio, diseases that have been carried into the area by people. But the group of tourists have been lucky. They've come across this family. But they can't watch for more than a few minutes. That's another rule that protects the gorillas. And then, just as the family emerge from the rainforest, they scamper away. It's two o'clock in the morning. These people are on a trek. They want to arrive at their destination before dawn breaks, so they've set out with torches at midnight to climb to the top of the mountain. It's worth all the hard work just to see this fantastic view, but they have to leave before the sun gets too hot. They're in a desert. This is the summit of Mount Sinai, the highest point in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. It's a very sacred place. It's the place where, according to the Bible, Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. We think of deserts as hot places, but even in deserts, the nighttime temperatures can be low. Tonight, it was only five degrees Celsius, but by the middle of the afternoon, it will have soared to 33 degrees. Lots of pilgrims come here, and some stay in this lovely chapel at the foot of the mountain, just as they've been doing for thousands of years. But unlike the early pilgrims, these tourists can escape the burning sun in their hotel rooms back at the coast. As well as being very hot, it's dry too. There's no rainy season here. Sinai gets hardly any rain at all. Luckily for these people, Mount Sinai is near the sea, the Red Sea, and there it's cooler. More and more tourists are flocking to the Red Sea. The water's warm and there's lots of fish to look at. And if you don't like the idea of swimming with them, you can watch them through the portholes of a submarine, just like this one. The Red Sea is becoming very popular with tourists. In this resort, there are already 80 hotels, and they plan to build another 300. The money the tourists bring in is important to the economy of countries like Egypt. But for places like the coast and the desert around Mount Sinai, the pressure on the landscape could bring problems in the future. Just think of all the water they'll use. 